molecules. And uh, I introduced the subject, and uh, we talked about different types of polymers. We might encounter the fact that uh, even for polymers of the same chemical composition, uh, they might have different structure, be branched or uh, other such things. Uh, and composition, we can actually mix different monomers and so on. And I talked a little bit about synthetic polymers to introduce what my colleagues will be talking about later when they talk about polymerization, chain and step polymerizations. And uh, I said a little bit about polymer nomenclature. Okay, that's, that's yesterday's handout. We've run out of today's handout, so you have to <laughs> have a... Have, uh, unless there's somebody out there still holding on desperately to extra copies of the handout. No, no. <laughs> Okay, we talked a bit about polymer nomenclature, the names we give to polymers, and how, uh, also how you can have one monomer uh, which can give different polymers depending on uh, how things occur. And one thing we said yesterday was that some are man-made, some are synthetic, and others are natural. So I'm going to say a little bit more about... It does that. It does that. Yeah. Regularly. Yeah. It just goes out and yeah. comes back. It's over here. <laughs> That's really good, isn't it? <laughs> Has anyone reported it, you know? Yeah, yeah Andrew, Andrew Horn just did it. Okay. All right, well, I hope you can see this screen, and we hope that one seat keeps going for, <laughs> for a while. Oh, dear. Not doing well. Okay, we're going to talk about natural polymers. Uh, we're then going to talk uh, uh, more generally about the forms in which you might find polymers. And then focus on two of those forms, glassy and rubbery polymers, and particularly think about what is it that makes a rubbery polymer uh, rubbery. So that's today's lecture. So very quickly, first of all, we, we were introduced yesterday to one polymer that's found in nature. Um, there's an example of it here. This is natural rubber. And that's the, the sort of rubber that's used to make this sort of tubing, which most of you will have seen in chemistry laboratories, and all sorts of other things. It's still uh, a component of many tyres, not all tyres, sometimes synthetic rubbers are used. Um, but this is an interesting polymer because uh, a tree produces it, and uh, uh, there are actually quite a few trees that produce rubbery molecules, but the one which is uh, used on a large scale is a tree from Brazil called Havia Brasiliensis. And we saw yesterday that this, uh, this is uh, cis 14 polyisoprene. If we change the arrangement around that double bond, you have another polymer, another natural polymer, gutta percha, but it has very different properties. So this one, it arises from trees like this. I've got one from Malaysia here. There's a lot of, of, of Brazil, Malaysia. So lot, lots of rubber trees in Malaysia. Yeah, they were taken from Brazil, large plantations in Malaysia. Have you, have you seen any of the plantations? Yeah. Yeah? No. So, so you're the expert. Anyone who wants to know about rubber plantations, we have a, we have a local expert here. Excellent. Um, and uh, this, this is, the, the, the rubber is actually found in a latex, a sort of milky, gooey, aqueous dispersion, which is exuded from the trunk if the trunk is damaged. So getting the rubber out involves tapping the tree, which actually means making a cut in the trunk. Uh, of the tree, which causes the latex to flow. You have a, something to collect it in a bucket type thing. Uh, and then that's collected, uh, coagulated. There's a lot of water in that. So the water is rolled out as much as possible. And then the material is dried. And so you have something uh, which is potentially useful. Now, rubber's been known for a long time. The ancient Egyptians knew that you could get this uh, intriguing substance out of uh, uh, intriguing substances out of trees. But it was a long time before it really became useful. Because although um, natural rubber has sort of elastic properties we associate with rubber, it doesn't tend to keep those properties over time because of something called creep. Um, uh, it actually flows over time. And it tends to be rather sticky until it gets gunked up with other stuff. So the first real commercial use um, was due to a guy named Charles Mackintosh, who gave his name to a type of coat, the Mackintosh. Uh, and uh, he originally worked in Glasgow and worked out that uh, you could do, make something useful by putting a bit of rubber, uh, and it involved um, a bit of clever chemistry, um, 
but putting it between two sheets of fabric to get a waterproof fabric. And although he uh, developed that in Glasgow, um, he then in 1825 built a factory in Manchester to produce that, and uh, uh, you can still see the remains of Macintosh's uh, rubber works. It's up near the where the Metropolitan University is now. Um, you can see it if you drive over the Mancunian Way or somewhere like that. A bit derelict now. But that's one thing you can do with rubber, but um, it still wasn't particularly useful. It, it needed, you know, it, it, there was something wrong with it. It needed to be cured. Actually, the term cure has come to, to be used for all sorts of things where you make the properties of something better, usually by heating it or adding something to it. Uh, and, and in general, it involves, in fact, cross-linking. And it's a guy named Charles Drudier who discovered that you could improve the properties of rubber by what he called, uh, what became known as, vulcanization. And this involved mixing in sulfur and then heating it. And what the sulfur does is build little bridges between the rubber molecules, creating a cross-linked network structure. And then it can't, uh, the molecules can't completely separate. And so we now have something which is really useful in order to get uh, the properties we associate with rubbers, properties of elasticity, uh, long-range elasticity, and such like. <coughs> so Goodyear himself, I mean, there's still a company called Goodyear. Goodyear himself didn't actually benefit from this. I believe he died in poverty. Um, but the company later was founded that took on his name. Uh, and you may have seen the Goodyear airships occasionally fly flying around. Yep. Okay, so that's natural rubber. Just quickly mention a few other natural polymers. We mentioned some of these yesterday. Polysaccharides, an important class of poly polymers made up of sugar units or monosaccharides. And uh, a very important example is the main structural component of wood. A very pure form of it is cotton. Uh, and of course, uh, it's also what we turn into paper and such like, and that is cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose uh, linked uh, beta, which is to do with the direction that this particular bond goes here. If it's alpha, then you have a completely different polymer, that's starch, which in fact, in turn, has a, a more than one component, a more branched and a less branched component, amylose and amylopectin. So sugar, polymers of sugars are very important in nature, and actually they're very important to us. And cellulose and chemical derivatives of cellulose are used for all kinds of things. And then, of course, in terms of biochemistry, the proteins are important. These are um, the macromolecules, which actually form, you know, they're important for hair and skin, and also important catalysts for making most of the reactions that go on in our bodies happen. And uh, proteins are made up of polypeptides, which are polymers of amino acids. Amino acids are molecules which have an amino end and a carboxylic acid at end, uh, join them together to form what well, chemists would call it an amide, but uh, they tend to be known as peptide bonds, where we have that particular sort of bond between amino acids. And by taking the, mix, the, 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 the amino acids which are commonly available, you can make a very large number of proteins. Very important to us. Another class of polymers which are biologically very important, again we mentioned them yesterday, someone said DNA, the nucleic acids, made of nucleotides, these are quite complex polymers. You've got a heterocyclic base, a purine or a pyridine, a sugar and a phosphate group. And of course, you probably know in DNA, you've got two strands to entwine together in a double helix. So that represents some important natural polymers. Yesterday, we mentioned some important synthetic polymers. Now let's just stop and think about uh, the forms in which we find polymers. Now, when we start out in chemistry, uh, we, we, we often talk about the physical states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. We tend to think of those as the main physical states. But we can sort of add to that. Um, we can talk about liquid crystalline states. We can talk about plasma, all, both of which are the fourth state of matter. But when we're dealing with polymers, we can find uh, ourselves dealing with things which are are they solid or are they liquid? They're actually somewhere between the two in some senses. Uh, and I'm talking here about glasses. So some polymers we meet, we encounter as glassy materials, organic glasses. 
They're usually, unless they're filled or coloured, transparent, they're brittle, they're hard, something like this polystyrene. Others will encounter as rubbery materials. We've mentioned rubbers, we're going to talk more about rubbers. And yet others will encounter like this high density polyethylene as a semi crystalline material which is quite tough but much more bendable, much uh, you know, flexible, tougher than a glass. If I try to bend that polystyrene like that, it'll snap, it'll break, it's brittle. But this is much tougher. So, what makes the difference between uh, these things? Why is it? And some of them, of course, we, if they're not too high in molar mass, we'll encounter them as oily liquids like this sample of polyoxyethylene. So, we can encounter polymers in many, many forms. But what makes the difference? What makes the difference at the molecular level? Why will one be glassy and another rubbery? Why will one form, crystal, form crystals and the other one not? Okay, let, first of all, um, you know, what, what, what polymers do we know of that are rubbery? What polymers do we know of that we meet as glassy polymers? And I've already given you some examples, so let's quickly whip through these. Uh, rubbers, we've mentioned natural rubber, cis. Uh, polyisoprene, here we have some lumps of it, and uh, once it's been vulcanized and various things have been added to it, you might end up with something like this. But there are others as well. Um, if you've ever played with super balls, uh, that's usually made from uh, cis polybutadiene. Uh, and again, this is polybutadiene, a very, very rubbery synthetic polymer. Um, polyisobutylene is important industrially, and you may have come across. Silicone rubber, polydimethyl siloxane, uh, which is um, uh, relatively resistant to oils and things. And there are many others that you could mention, but here are four that you should be aware of. Natural rubber, butadiene, isobutylene, dimethyl siloxane, <coughs> polydimethyl siloxane. They're all rubbery materials, elastomeric materials at the temperatures at which we normally meet them. Uh, on the other hand, if we take something like polystyrene, uh, like this, um, or polymethyl methacrylate, we mentioned that, that's, what's, that's perspex, that's the thing that's often used as a plastic replacement for an inorganic glass. These things are hard and brittle at uh, room temperature. They're glassy materials. So we're going to ask the question, what makes the difference? What is it about the structure of these things, which means we encounter them as glasses, whereas the structure of... Uh, those things means we meet them as rubbers. Can we actually look at a chemical structure and, and make a guess as to whether it will be glassy or rubbery? But then we've also mentioned that there are others which can, to some extent, crystallise. They're never completely crystalline in the forms in which we meet them. They're semi-crystalline. Uh, so uh, we have a mixture of little crystalline areas and amorphous areas, which may be rubbery or glassy. And polyethylene is a very good example of a semi-crystalline polymer. And you may also have met the variant where you have all fluorines instead of high hydrogens, polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, that's Teflon, that's the stuff that's used as non-stick on uh, frying pans and things like that. So, we encounter polymers in a variety of different forms. But what are they actually like at the molecular level? Now, if we want to get information about how molecules are organized, the technique that all chemists should know about is X-ray diffraction or X-ray scattering. Yeah, have you all heard of, you all know a bit about X-ray diffraction? So if you've made, a, if you've made a, an organic, a simple organic molecule, and you really want to know what you've got and what it can do, then what you'll often try to do is to get a lar reasonably large single crystal of it and then uh, you put that into an X-ray diffractometer, you get a pattern of spots. The uh, positions of those spots define a lattice, a way in which molecules are organized in space. And with a bit of a few assumptions and a lot of clever maths from the in relative intensities, uh, you can, uh, if you're lucky, work out the precise arrangements of those molecules, where each atom is, uh, in the way those molecules fit together. So we have a well-defined crystalline material, in X-ray scattering you'll see a series of spots. Now if you take a typical polymer and do the same thing, what you'll actually get is not usually lots of spots, but a series of rings 
superimposed on a sort of broad mass of scattering. And those rings are actually pretty much the same as what you get if you look at a powdered sample, which has lots of little tiny crystals all pointing in different directions. It looks like a powder diffraction pattern. And that's telling us that in our polymer sample, that typically we haven't got big crystals, what we've got is lots of tiny little crystalline regions all pointing in different directions. Okay, so a semi-crystalline polymer typically looks like a powder pattern. It's a bit more complex than that. If you take a fibre and pull it, or draw it, you can start to align things, and then those rings start to split up into what are called layer lines. <laughs> They're no, nowhere near as um, ordered as, as the sort of pattern of spots you get with a small molecule single pit crystal, but they're telling you something about the arrangement. And so we can use X-ray scattering to tell us something about what we have in a semi-crystalline polymer. Actually, uh, in a later lecture we'll see how the molecules are organised in something like polyethylene gets a bit more complex than that, because you've got to think not only about the very local arrangement that X-ray scattering picks up, but also the larger arrangement, the morphology that we have when those molecules organise themselves. But what if we take a look at a liquid by X-ray scattering? Now, in a liquid, you don't have, again, going back to very basic chemistry, this is the stuff you do at the beginning of the first year. In a liquid, you don't have long-range order. So you don't see lots of well-defined spots. But there is organisation in liquid. If you've got a molecule in a liquid here, then the next molecule, OK, it, there's a certain probability it will be a certain distance away. It's not going to be a long way away, because then you've got a hole. It's not going to be too close, because they can't get too close. So there is structure, but it's not well-defined translational structure as you get in a three-dimensional crystalline material. And so what you see in an X-ray scattering experiment is what's known as a diffuse half halo, a region of scattering, fairly ill-defined, but distinctive of a liquid. Now let's take a glass. What is this, what is this more like, a liquid or a crystal? It's amazing how often people look at that and think, right, it's hard, brittle, transparent, and they call it a crystal. It's not. It doesn't show any long-range order whatsoever. If you put it in an X-ray scattering machine, you don't see any spots or well-defined rings. You just see a diffuse halo exactly as if it were a liquid. A glass is simply a liquid that cannot flow. At the molecular level, it's just like a liquid. The scattering behavior is just like a liquid. It's amorphous. Amorphous means there's no regular three-dimensional structure. But it's a liquid which actually cannot move. To move, there has to be enough space and mechanisms of movement. And when we have long chain molecules all tangled up, if we cool the sample down enough, we actually lose space for things to move, and we get to a point where the molecules can no longer move, at least over the time scale that we look at it. So, if we take a low molecular weight polymer like this one, this, this, you know, this looks like a fluid. If we take something like this polystyrene, from the point of view of X-ray scattering, this is just like a liquid. But it's a liquid that can't move. That's a glass. Whereas this, actually contains little crystalline regions, but they're very tiny crystalline regions. We'll talk later about how they're organised. So, if we think about the, all the range of polymers we might have and what, what might affect them, well, um, the properties we get, we've got all sorts of different things. Some are more liquid, some are glassy, some uh, elastomeric, some are semi-crystalline. What makes the difference? Well, uh, Things to do with the molecules we've got. What repeat units are in there? What's the composition? How are they organised? Is it branched or isn't it branched? The distribution of molecular sizes or molar mass. We'll talk more about that later in the course. And all of those things depend on what happens during polymerization. They depend on the chemistry of how the polymers are made. But you will also find that what you see depends on other things. Depends on how the molecules are organised particularly if you're dealing with a semi-crystalline polymer. And actually, to a certain extent, 
with glasses as well. The properties actually depend on the history of the sample. What temperatures it's seen for how long and such like. So when we're dealing with polymers, you have to think not only about what do you have at the molecular level, what went on in the chemistry of the polymerization, but also what has happened to that sample since you made it. Because that also affects the properties. I see, notice it going out. I never notice it coming back again. <laughs> So, what I want to focus on now are uh, glasses and rubbers. What makes the difference? Now, actually, anything which is rubbery can also be glassy, and most things which are glassy can also be rubbery. It all depends on what temperature we're looking at. And so there is a temperature which marks a transition from glassy behaviour to rubbery behaviour. Now, it's a rather funny transition. It's not quite like any of the other, of the other transitions you will know about. Okay. Now, you will know about certain things. Uh, again, going back to very basic chemistry, the sort of stuff you learn when you first start out. You learn that uh, if you've got a crystal, it will melt at a certain temperature. Yeah? So you have a melting point, a well-defined melting point. That's a first-order <coughs> thermodynamic change. And you know that that melting is associated with certain things. There's a sudden change in volume at the melting point. The density of the solid is different to the density of the liquid. And you probably know, usually, for most things, the solid is more dense. The exception, a very important exception, is water, whereas you probably know the solid is less dense. But either way, the point is that when you go through that thermodynamic transition, when you get a melting point, there is an actual change in volume of a certain sample at that very specific temperature. And other things change as well. There's a step change in the enthalpy of the system. And it'll become important later when we talk about differential scanning calorimetry, because the derivative of enthalpy is heat capacity. We'll meet that later. Now, there are other transitions that you may also encounter, which are known as second-order transitions. Uh, where there isn't a step change, where there isn't a step change at the, mil at, the, at the temperature of the transition, but there might be a change in the way things actually change with temperature, a change in the slope of the property we're measuring, uh, volume or entropy or whatever. Now, a glass transition is in some ways a little bit like a second order phase transition. But even there, people argue, still argue, as to whether there's a true thermodynamic transition, or because everything we see is actually dominated by kinetics. It's a situation where kinetics are so important, and because it's all to do with how molecules are able to move or not able to move. And so kinetics actually override it. There may be a therm an underlying thermodynamic transition, but what we see is dominated by kinetics. And as good chemists, in at least your third year or later, you know that a lot of things, there's a balance between thermodynamics and kinetics. And some things are controlled by thermodynamics, some things are controlled by kinetics. Okay, so if we take a polymer sample... Uh, what will happen as the temperature is changed, and uh, we'll assume it's a polymer that doesn't um, uh, crystallize. We start out at a low temperature and increase the temperature. Well, uh, we know that everything expands as temperature goes up. Yeah? And so, you know, if we take something like uh, this, polystyrene, and heat it up, uh, and measure the volume, perhaps have a little sample in what's called a dilatometer, a glass thing, filled in the old days with mercury, we don't do that these days, and it has a little capillary attached to that, so as the, as the sample expands, we can see the mercury going up the capillary. Long time ago, we used to do that experiment in the teaching lab. That's gone. Um, uh, you get to a point where suddenly things start expanding much more rapidly. And that's where you've gone through your glass transition. You've gone from a glassy state to a rubbery state. But remember, both states are amorphous. There's no melting involved. There was no regularity to begin with. 
There's no sudden change in volume or enthalpy or anything like that. It's not like a first order thermodynamic change. And it gets even more complicated that. Now, in the case of polystyrene, that occurs at around 100 degrees. I say around because actually when exactly it occurs depends on exactly what experiment you're doing, on the details of the sample, on the history of the sample. But around 100 degrees centigrade is the glass transition for polystyrene. But what if we take something like our natural rubber? It's rubbery when we meet it, but if we cool it down, what's happening is it's contracting, it's contracting, it's contracting, and you'll get to a point where there's no longer enough spare space for the molecules to move around, and now it's going to be glassy. I'm sure as many of you have seen this demonstration before. Has anyone not seen this demonstration? Okay, so this here, this is uh, liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, uh, the boiling point is 77 Kelvin, that's what is it, minus 196 degrees centigrade, something like that, so it's pretty cold in there. So what's going to happen if we take our rubber and put the tit in liquid nitrogen? We're going to cool it down uh, pretty dramatically. Convinced? Well, it started to warm up now. It's still fairly rigid and quite cool. <laughs> okay, so any rubbery polymer, actually, if we cool it down enough, it will become glassy. You will get to a point where, there, where as, the, as the volume contracts, there is no longer enough space, what we call free volume, for the molecules to move around, at least over time. Because it is a rather odd transition. <coughs> The value you measure depends on how long you give it. In other words, it isn't just the temperature, it involves temperature and time scale. Okay, so this is something called silly putty. This actually has a glass transition very close to room temperature. Uh, so if I do things slowly, I can pull it out, it behaves like a putty. Now, however, if I do something very suddenly and sharply, okay, uh, so pull it slowly, it behaves like a putty. Pull it sharp, now have a look at the end where it breaks. It's a sharp end, like a shiny end. That's how a brittle, that's how a glass breaks. That's how a brittle thing breaks. Do something slowly, it behaves like a putty. Do something rapidly, it behaves like a glass. So the glass transition is not like you know, a melting point. You have a small, low molar, ma molar mass material, little molecules that you're used to have a well-defined melting point. That's traditionally one way you work out if something's pure. Polymers, actually when you get to semi-crystalline polymers, we realize that with polymers, even the melting points aren't well-defined because they depend on the history of the sample. But for the glass transition, that's completely different because it's a transition that's dominated by kinetics. It depends on time scale as well as temperature. Because it's about giving molecules time to move. If you don't give it time to move, it's glassy behavior. If you give it a long time so they can be able to move, it's more like rubbery behavior or flow. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a transition uh, when we go from glassy to rubbery behaviour. If, if we're increasing the temperature, so we have a glass, we raise the temperature, it will become rubbery uh, that when we're able to have 
relatively large scale motions of our polymer molecules. Not necessarily the whole mo molecule, but significant <coughs> chunks able to move. So these are relatively large, long range, large scale, and they're motions, and they're cooperative, which means that for one bit thing to happen, another thing also has to happen. Things have to work together for changes to occur. So now, you know, once we start to understand that, the difference between a glass and a rubber is about ease of mobility, the ease with which molecule, polymer molecules can reorganize themselves, can move around, can rearrange, we can start to think about what it is about the molecular structure of a polymer, which means that at room temperature, this thing might be rubbery, but this one might be glassy. What's going to make the difference? It's all about movement of molecules, and so if we have a very flexible molecule, what we mean by that, what we mean by that is that it's very easy to get rotation about bonds in the backbone. If we have a very flexible molecule, then it's like we're likely to meet it as a rubber. On the other hand, if we've got groups, functional groups that interact strongly with each other, that's going to restrict mobility. So anything that, anything that restricts mobility is going to... Uh, tend to meet, to push up the glass transition temperature and mean that we'll meet it as a glass. So the flexibility of the chain and the strength of the intermolecular forces, which we can measure in terms of something we call a cohesive energy density, will determine whether we encounter something at the temperatures we're normally working as a rubbery polymer or a glassy polymer. So we take silicone rubber, polydimethylsiloxane. Okay, the backbone here, this is a backbone with no carbons in it. The backbone is silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen. And those are bonds which have got very easy rotation about them. We've only got little groups on the side, just methyl groups on the side, not much to restrict rotation, no strong interactions. Uh, this is a very rubbery polymer. Um, Cohesive energy density, 242 joules per cubic centimetre is the value I've got there. That's relatively low for polymer. The glass transition is down at minus 120 degrees centigrade. You've got to cool it down to minus 120 degrees centigrade before it becomes glassy. On the other hand, if we think about uh, this polymer, polystyrene, okay, which has, this is a typical vinyl polymer, it's a carbon backbone, but the side group, the R group on the side, that's a big aromatic ring. So for rotation about the backbone, you've got to move a whole aromatic ring. Okay? That restricts rotation. That makes it harder for things to move. Plus, uh, we've got strong interactions between aromatic rings and relatively high cohesive energy density. And so that all pushes up the glass transition to somewhere around 100 degrees centigrade. And so we generally meet it as a glass. And we can start to think about what, uh, what is going to actually affect TG. If we, so if, you know, if we've got bulky side groups, by and large, we'll expect that would hinder internal rotation and lead to a higher glass transition. On the other hand, if we have long dangly groups, actually they um, uh, uh, can have the opposite effect because they actually stop chains uh, packing and adhering to each other very well, and so they can tend to lower TG, not always, but in some cases. If we've got anything which interacts strongly, polar groups, side groups, for example, that increases intermolecular interactions, and so that will tend to raise the glass transition temperature. And so, as good chemists, not, you, know, you should be able to have a good guess just from looking at the structure, whether something is likely to be rubbery or glassy. Because you know about these things. You know about uh, changes of conformation. You've learned a bit about that in organic stereochemistry, and you'll learn a bit more about it on this course. And you know about intermolecular forces. What is it that uh, involves strong interactions? What is it that involves weak interactions? And all that comes into play when we think about this. But I also mentioned that when, um, in the context of natural rubber, that it was known for centuries, but... Uh, it took a good year to come up with vulcanization to actually make a lot of useful things out of it. And what he discovered is that to actually get a lot of useful, of useful properties out of rubber, it actually needs to be crosslinked. Not too much, but a certain amount. So the molecules don't move apart completely. If they're too flexible, 
you effectively have flow over time. And the crosslinks are there to stop that happening. So that the, what we'll see is the intrinsic elasticity of the molecules can be utilized. So let's think a little bit more about these elastomeric or rubbery materials. I mean, have you ever stopped to think how amazing a rubber band is? <laughs> now, this is a phenomenal bit of material science here. <laughs> um, if, you know, if we think about something like this, it's, we, we can take something, we can stretch it, let go, and it, and it remembers its old shape. It goes back to the shape that it was. We're used to it. Have you ever thought, that's really weird? It's really weird. You know, way back in the 1800s, people would... Well, certainly the 19, no, the late 1800s, people were trying to work out why. How did it do that? And it wasn't until Staudinger convinced people that this contained big molecules that someone could actually explain it. So it's actually quite remarkable. Mo these are molecules with a memory. You distort them, they remember exactly where they were. They recover the dimension. But not only that, you can do it, you know, a, a little child can stretch a rubber band. It doesn't need a strong force to deform it, yet it still remembers how it was. That's remarkable. Almost everything is elastic on a small scale with strong forces, but this is elastic over a massive scale with very small forces. That's an amazing thing. How is it explained? So, if we have a, a crystal, here's a crystal, this is a quartz crystal, nothing like rubber whatsoever. It is elastic on a small scale. Okay? Uh, elastic means if you distort it, it recovers its original shape. So, if we think of a normal crystalline solid, what gives rise to elasticity there? And can we explain the elasticity of a rubber in the same way? So first of all, when we think about a crystalline solid, that's where we do have a regular arrangement of atoms or molecules. And there are forces of interaction between them. Again, going back to what you know about intermolecular forces. You all know those intermolecular potential curves that you must have drawn a hundred times, a thousand times. And so if you actually pull atoms apart, you're pulling things away from a preferred distance from an energy minimum. And so there's uh, an effective force which will uh, want to pull those atoms back in towards a, uh, a minimum energy. But of course, that can only happen over a very small scale. Whereas with, a piece of, with a, an elastic band, we need a little force, we can deform it a lot, and it can still recover. So we cannot explain the elasticity of a rubber in the same way as we explain the elasticity of a crystalline solid. Now, there are a number of odd things about rubber. Uh, and uh, here are some of the odd things that people noticed before they had any way of explaining them. Okay. So, first of all, if you take a, a piece of rubber and then apply a force and measure the length and then heat it up, it actually contracts. Now, remember, most things expand when heated. But if we have a stretched piece of rubber, it contracts when heated. That's telling us something. But what is it telling us? Alternatively, if you hold it a certain length and measure the force, as you heat it, the force increases. Most things, the force would decrease. And if you stretch it adiabatically, it actually gets hotter. The temperature increases. So three intriguing things that were observed a long time ago. And uh, the guy who actually worked a lot of this out uh, was a guy named John Gutt. He was born in 1757. So this is the, the late 1700s, early 1800s that people were doing these experiments. Remember, it wasn't until the 1930s that people could actually explain these results. But what they did know about then was thermodynamics. They knew the implications. They just didn't have a molecular understanding of it. But John Guff was an interesting character. He lived near Kendall in the late... Have we got anyone from the Lake District here? Yeah. Good, wonderful place. My favourite place in the world. <laughs> Where about you from? Keswick? Wonderful. Um, 
<laughs> John Guff actually lived near Kendall. Um, and the thing about him is he was blind. But he did lots of amazing experiments, noticed things no one else did. And remember I mentioned stretch a piece of rubber, a, 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 the temperature increases. How did Guff determine that? Well, lips are very sensitive to temperature changes, so he used his lips to detect the temperature change. And you can see here the first report of the thermochemical properties of rubber. And they were reported to a society which still exists, which is the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. And you may well know that John Dalton, before there was a university in Manchester, uh, John Dalton, father of the modern atomic theory. Again, he came from near the Lake District, Eaglesfield, on the west of the Lake District. Um, but he spent most of his working life in Manchester. Uh, and there wasn't a university here, um, but he actually had a lab for a lot of that time and, and, and effectively lived in what was then the offices of the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. So this was an important society. Uh, a, a lot of Gus's experiments, Jewell's early experiments, a lot of key experiments that laid the foundations of modern chemistry and modern physics were communicated to the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. I'm not sure it's quite so um, prestigious nowadays. So that's another story. But anyhow, uh, here we have um, Guff. Uh, it says, the substance called caoutchouc or Indian rubber possesses a singular property which I believe has never been taken notice of in print, at least by any English writer. The present letter contains my experiments and reflections on the subject, and should they appear to deserve the attention of your philosophical friends, I'm certain you will take the trouble of communicating the paper to the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. And he goes on to describe the thermochemical properties that I've mentioned. <coughs> now, I'm not going to go through all of the maths. Some of you will be pleased to know. You can go away and look it up for yourselves if you want. But those three things that I mentioned actually have thermodynamic implications. And they're and uh, thermodynamic implication is quite simple. When we stretch a piece of rubber, the entropy goes down. Entropy decreases on stretching. Uh, and also we know that, it's, that the behaviour of rubber in here is dominated by the entropy, the enthalpic contribution. And we all know, again, we're all chemists, we all know that... Uh, we can think of the driving force for any process, any reaction, if we are under constant pressure conditions in terms of Gibbs energy, which is a balance between entropy and entropy. Yeah, this is all stuff we all know about and love, don't we? Yeah. Uh, but here the entropy term is, is, is the dominant term, and it's entropy that's driving this elastic behavior. And that was known back in the early 1800s, that... Uh, Communication was actually 1803. It was read to the Literary and Philosophical Society of Manchester. And after that, people developed, people understood the thermodynamics. Probably better than most of us here. But what they did not have was an explanation. They tried all sorts of explanations, um, but it really didn't work out. Until uh, 1932. Remember... I said yesterday that it was in the 1920s that Hermann Staudin was trying to convince people that polymers actually contained enormous molecules. And it wasn't until about 1929, 1930 that that became generally accepted. But once one had that idea, one had the basis for understanding what was going on in a piece of rubber. And Meyer actually worked out or suggested that... Uh, this elastic behaviour piece of rubber is linked actually to the elastic behaviour of a single long chain molecule. That actually a single molecule behaves elastically and in a piece of rubber that elastic behaviour of the single molecule is translated into the elastic behaviour of the whole thing. And why is that? Remember this is all about entropy. Those who've got a long chain molecule, we stretch it right out we have one confirmation. Entropy, remember, is about the number of arrangements of something. Coil it up, we have many possible confirmations. So stretched out means low entropy, coiled up means high entropy. Now we have a thermodynamic firing force. Stretch it out, it wants to return to a more probable, higher entropy state. That essentially 
is the basis of Upmeyer's theory. Of course, he worked it out mathematically and drew some conclusions, which I'm not going to go into on this particular course. So if we have a coiled polymer, we've got many chains, rapidly chain conformation, many conformations, high entropy, stretch it out, we only have one conformation, low entropy, that means there's a driving force for the chain to contract. In other words, the elasticity of a rubber molecule results from the return of an extended chain to a more probable higher entropy state. <coughs> Why do we cross-link them? To stop the chains moving apart completely, so we can actually capture that elastic behaviour. And in the network, then we can actually treat the length of chain between crosslinks, in fact, uh, mathematically in the same way as we treat an isolated chain. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I just want to introduce you to the concept that this elasticity is entropy driven, and it could only be understood when we had the concept of large chain molecules which are able to change conformation. So that's where we leave it for today. And next Monday, we're going to go on to think about semi-crystalline polymers in that context.